with competency, I really like that you included um, the the word constraints because it sounds like um, you you we're including within that or within that idea, um, you know, or rather, we're not saying that there needs to be you know one particular way for someone to to do a thing. And there's not a, you know perhaps a singular solution for a movement problem because if we're talking about athletes, <clears throat> almost irrespective of what the the sport or the activity is, there are going to be a, a myriad of situations that they might find themselves in. And we, you know, we've talked about dynamic systems and, um, you know, motor scale acquisition a few times in the last few months. Um, but with the, you know, the highly skilled athletes, they've got lots of moving variability more so than say your intermediate mm-hmm. athletes, just because they've got more solutions available to them and you can, train that you know to a large extent just by manipulating the constraints of the task uh, the tasks that they're subjected to um, which then probably goes a long way in terms of equipping them to 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 feel confident and then also to perform you know uh, as well as they can in, in a in most situations they might find themselves in yeah they have the ability to accommodate to an ever-changing ever-shifting environment and and regulate um, potential disturbances or perturbations and, and still come up with a optimal or ideal um, uh, solution, you know, and, and it might not be something uh, that is entirely efficient. So, you know, I look at efficient as just the cost of, of doing business. Um, it might not be entirely efficient, but it's still for them optimal in regard to, hey, I maximize my potential as best I could uh, while knowing that, hey, there was a little bit of a, a disturbance or, or something happened that I would have rather not, but I had the uh, the right amount of adaptability and variability to do so. I see competency and variability as very intertwined and related. As you, as you mentioned, competency can almost be distilled down to just consistent outcomes. But, but consistent outcomes, again, you can, you can get the outcome a myriad of ways. And there's a phrase by one of the forefathers of, of motor school acquisition, Nikolai Bernstein, who, was, who would always say uh, repetition without repetition. So a skilled, mm-hmm. a skilled blacksmith is consistent in the outcome, but no repetition looks exactly the same. Mm-hmm. And you can think about skilled athletes where they can – they can achieve the outcome in a myriad of different ways. And for, if we talk about this clinically, typically athletes are coming to us and their, their variability is decreased and maybe, and their outcomes are variable as well, typically, but Mm -hmm. sometimes, and then they can progress perhaps through the initial stages of rehab where now we can, we can, like you said, Jared, we can constrain the task to a point where we can get consistent outcomes, but, not in a, not in variable scenarios, their variability is still low. Their their competency is maybe getting a little bit better within the constraints, be it, be it a range of motion constraint or a speed constraint. Maybe we've had to slow the movement down, uh, use less load, that t- or like more and more top down instruction, where it's more of a structured activity as opposed to, to their perception. You know, kind of driving the action, that type of thing. But then we can start to take away those constraints a little bit, which I don't want to jump too far ahead, but you've talked about phases of rehab starting with control and progressing to chaos. And I want to talk a little mm-hmm. bit about that, but it sounds like we're kind of getting into that. So I like when you were you were kind of tying in competency there with, with variability. And I also want to talk about tolerance versus capacity because when we, we have these philosophical discussions, for some people it can be hard to like, how is this clinically relevant? But you, right. you gave an example that I think is, is totally relevant. I think tolerance versus capacity is relevant in most clinical situations. So it was, it was the runner who can't tolerate running at all. So as soon as they start to do anything more than a walk, let's say patellar tendinopathy or, or Achilles tendinopathy or something like that, whatever it is, mm-hmm. as, soon as, they, as soon as they transition into that task, they feel their irritability or, or their sensitivity or the, whatever they're coming to you for starts to appear versus a capacity issue where they can do their thing and their, their lack of tolerance doesn't show 
until a certain point in their capacity, but they can actually push the threshold of their capacity before they become intolerant. So there's an interplay there. So you have these two yes. athletes, and you have, they have different thresholds, essentially. Can, can you, I know this is kind of like hypotheticals, but can you maybe talk a little bit about how the initial rehab process would be different for those two athletes in terms of maybe how you would allow them to program or allow them to go through their activity just on the day to day and also what you would be doing in the clinic for somebody who's got a very low tolerance, not even touching their capacity versus someone who their tolerance is higher and they can, they can push into their capacity a little bit more. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. It makes complete sense. Absolutely. I, I love that question. Um, so for, for tolerance for me, it would be more of, again, it's along the lines of, okay, they, they, uh, exceeded their envelope of function, so to speak. It's very, very low. Uh, and so I want to use some level of load uh, for induction of graded exposure. Um, if we're speaking of specifically a tendon, uh, we, we know that load is the language of, of tendons. And so if we can uh, manipulate load enough to where we can start to induce stress and the stress that they can tolerate, um, for me, I'm using higher uh, frequency um, because I want them to get more dosage throughout the day of that particular stimulus um, in order to hopefully try to create an adaptation. And it might not be at that point um, for this the, the low tolerance individual. It might not be at a point where we're creating true adaptation um, to the the tissue. But what we might be doing is creating an adaptation um, to the brain in regard to taking off um, – the threat perception, so to speak, and becoming less apprehensive to that, that stimulus. So for that individual, it might be, uh, let's find a movement um, and a load that you can tolerate. A lot of times what I've seen and some of the research points to this, although it is kind of changing a little bit now, uh, is that isometrics can be relatively beneficial um, for someone that has low tolerance level. Let's just perform a uh, again, it depends on is it mid-sertional, is it is it insertional, um, or mid-portion versus insertional. But you know, let's 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 choose a height that you can tolerate. Let's choose a length of time that you can tolerate that load, and then I want you to do that um, maybe twice, preferably I'd like to get it three times because again, I'm more of a of a frequency as opposed to just one dosage a day. Um, and, and I want to see how they do with that and what the 24-hour period looks like for them. Um, so when they come back in, do we need to um, titrate anything a little bit? Because, you know, I, I always use the <clears throat> the analogy for them that movement and, and load is medicine. We just have to make sure that we get the dosage correctly. We might we might go over and that's OK. We know what to do and to kind of recalibrate things if we go over. If it's under, uh, then we can push it up just a little bit. But we want to find that sweet spot that you're able to tolerate um, that your body can regulate well. If we're looking at capacity, um, then for that individual, um, I'm looking at probably uh, manipulating just a little bit uh, their current workout. And, and what I want to do is say, hey, let's uh, reduce your uh, workload just a little bit. And, and we're going to reduce things. But I'm going to increase your um, maybe your biomotor uh, quality. So, you know, for that individual, um, I might just look at overall either muscular strength or endurance. I would do a, a heel rise test, um, which is looking at uh, 30 beats per minute of a, of a heel raise. Uh, and they're going to do that for around 25 to 30 reps. Um, there are some specific norms, um, but I kind of got that one from uh, uh, Chris Johnson. Um, and that allows me to see, you know, what what is the capacity on the involved versus the uninvolved limb? And from there, how do I become a little bit more specific about the dosage that I'm giving them in regard to the, um, the, the, the load as well as the repetitions in the set, so the overall uh, volume? Um, and then for that individual, I want to bridge the gap from where they are now um, to getting back into surpassing their running mileage by – hopefully getting elastic as soon as I can. I'm thinking of if it's tendon related, they have a lack of uh, sustainable elasticity. And if I can start to do a little bit more rapid elastic motions sooner, um, 
some some research has been shown that that actually can induce a little bit more of the the, the collagen synthesis. So, um, again, we don't have to have that in order to decrease discomfort and increase capacity. But you know, I think having the ability to sustain uh, repeatable elasticity improves capacity of a of a tendon, and so that might be doing uh, prescribed pogo exercises or jump roping. Uh, exercises as well, as opposed to only doing heavy isometrics or isotonic work to the the tendon. I want to make things that have a little bit better carryover to their their task. And yeah, so pole going or jump ropes, or even just pretending you're jump roping, but just that's basically a pogo. Mm -hmm. That to me, when you said before. It's ver- you vary the task. Novelty is powerful, but it's not very it's not variability for the sake of variability. Mm-hmm. And that's what I think we get into in the rehab world a lot, where you see you see exercises that look difficult just because there's like four things involved and you're like juggling and you're on the BOSU ball, you know, <laughs> and, you're, you're, and you've got the and then you've got. Uh, you're wearing, maybe you're wearing glasses that that obstruct your vision, and there's like a whole. And you're on fire. Thing. You're on fire. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but let's say pogoing, very simple exercise, but you've you've constrained the task to be able to control the dose, because somebody could could say, "Well, can't I just run?" Well, yes, but but you've already mentioned, Jared, that you're controlling their workload, and as far as that's concerned as well. But running is a is less constrained. It's less controllable. The do, like you're not there controlling their cadence and really mm-hmm. controlling their mileage and controlling the terrain. All of these little things that factor into the actual stress of that of that dosage of that bout. But something like pole going or just jump ropes, you can be very very controlled with the dosage, and you can pick an arbitrary dose and then just base your next decision on how they tolerated that dosage. But to me, that's an, would that be an example? That's a, it's a varied task, but it's specific to the qualities that you're trying to develop for their goal activity. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. Allowing them to adapt uh, to that particular stimulus and it's varied enough as well um, to where it's not, it's not specific um, it's not specifically the the task, but it, it has enough and it emulates enough of the qualities that will bridge the gap and be able to transition them back to their task without there being this huge spike um, in their uh, load tolerance um, or a huge spike in just the quote unquote novelty of the the activity because it's like, oh man, I haven't done this in a, in a long time. Well, no, you actually have. We've just changed it a little bit. But, you know, the pogo has great carryover because we're, we're looking at the elasticity, the ground contact times, things of that nature um, that mimic the similar situations that you're going to be in when you're when you're running. And I like double leg pogos as well, because I'm thinking of, well, two points of contact as opposed to one point of contact with uh, with running. So, you know, we have to account for more force being induced onto the, the tendon as opposed to um double leg where force is going to be going across uh, both both limbs upon contact with the ground. 